All right, so as you all know, I'm uh, just coming back from that Midwest Fundamentalist Conference in Cincinnati, Ohio, and man, what a great conference that was. There's a lot of people there that are stirred up and on fire and, and ready to serve the Lord. Heard a lot of great preaching, as well as participated in a lot of great soul winning, too. We went out to um, these government housing projects, and, and it was so receptive out there. People were just out and about. The weather was nice. And we had opportunity to get in a conversation after conversation and a lot of people got saved. I think the total number for the two days was like 65 souls saved. So it was a really, really, really good conference. And one of the things though that came up that just kept drawing my mind back to uh, the Bible and the back of the, ultimately the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts is my favorite book of the whole Bible. It always has been since I got saved. Uh, I love the fact that you have all these exciting, I think this is like the most, some of the most exciting stories is found in the book of Acts where you see people, you see believers, you see Christians, you know, after Jesus Christ is resurrected, now it's their job to go out and do this work. And you see all these stories of people going out and preaching the word of God, and way, way, way back, I remember having a conversation with Pastor Anderson at like some of the very first days or weeks of, of attending that church and just commenting on how, man, wouldn't it be great to, to live in this time, you know, in the book of Acts and they're doing all these great things and there, you know, there's all this work being done. It's all exciting. And, I, and I'll never forget the response. And I don't remember it verbatim, but I'll never forget the essence of what the response was from Pastor Anderson saying, you know, well, there's no, basically there's no reason why we can't have that still today and still have people fired up and still do the same great works and still go out and do this, right? There's, there's no reason why that level of excitement can't be done and that spirit can't be done today and all that great work can't be done today. And that was, that was momentous for me because it's a, yeah, stupid, of course, right? It, it, it's a, such an obvious truth but sometimes you can get yourself in a mentality or in a mindset of just, oh, that's the past and that was then, but now, no, we're in the Laodicean age, right? And you hear this stupid stuff preached. And you know what? Other people may be lukewarm, but it doesn't mean you have to be. That's right. And even just that little bit of encouragement, that little word just saying, you know what? We can do the same thing. Amen. And that's exciting. And you know what? We can do the same thing. And you know what? That's what God wants us to do. And that's what God is instructing us to do. And he's probably, you know, practically ready to bang his head against the wall going, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Right? Here's the example. It's written down for you. It's been preserved for you. And Christians throughout ages have had this at their disposal to see and go and do likewise. And I think this is happening. And I think there are churches now that are still trying to carry the mantle and still trying to carry that torch and bring the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and do these great, amazing acts. And you know what I think is interesting is that anytime you have people that get motivated and get excited and start doing big things and start doing great works for God, you're going to have opposition. And you know what? When you see the opposition, the world's going to tell you or liberal Christianity is going to tell you, the watered down Christianity is going to tell you, oh, you must not be doing it right. Because they think that everybody's going to love Jesus and everyone should accept you and that, and that you should never have anybody trying to shut you down you know, because then you're not doing it right. You're not being nice enough. You're not being friendly enough. You're not being loving enough or whatever they want to say. But you know what? I'm sorry. When I read the Bible... When I read about people who really were getting things done, it was opposition after opposition after opposition trying to be shut down, being arrested, being beaten, being thrown in jail, having people go around and, and just try to bring people against you. That's what I see happening. And this is no different. And you know what? It's encouraging to me. And you know what's motivating? It's motivating our group. And this is, this is the thing that the enemy will never understand is that the harder you try to stop people like us from doing what we're doing, the harder we're going to go off and we're going to fight and we're going to do even more. Amen. And you're going to stir us up and fire us even more and we're going to do even greater works. Go ahead, bring it on, try to stop us. See what happens. You're going you're gonna to make us even more motivated to reach even more people because that's what's happening. But it's interesting also because... You know, these people, these, these false brethren, these false prophets, these God-haters, the people that want to stop the work from being done, 
They're going to be out there like snakes trying to poison people's minds against what's being done. But without even going in depth on any of the reasoning that the people who are trying to attack are making, if you just take it from a high level and you compare what's being done recently with just what we see in Scripture, it's pretty easy to see who's right and who's wrong. And what I mean by that is you start looking at the tactics that people are using. Start looking at the tactics. Start, start looking at, the, at, at how they're going about trying to silence and try to stop us. You see this over and over and over again throughout the Bible. And we're going to spend a lot of time this morning going through, literally going through the book of Acts and seeing how the disciples were trying to be stopped and trying to have their message censored and trying to be shut down from having speaking engagements. And you know what else you're going to find also as we go through this? When you see the godly people, the righteous people, disciples, they didn't go out trying to shut down other people's speaking events. They didn't go out and, and we're going into the synagogue and we're shutting down this and we're going to have a protest and we're going to scream our heads off and, and, and shout down these rabbis who are, who are preaching their false gospel and we're going to make sure that they can't speak. You never see a godly person doing that. You never see a person of God going out and just making sure, no, we need to shut down this and shut down that. You know why? Because they're actually motivated to go out and do the right thing. They're not worried about silencing every false teacher. They're saying, we don't have time for that because we're out just spreading the gospel. We're out doing the right thing. So we don't have time to go and just make sure we could shut everyone else down from speaking. The people who do that are weak and cowardly and they have, no, they have no way of getting people and drawing people to their message because they don't have the truth. And they need to, to use a tactic like shutting people down because they've got nothing on their own to combat. And I'm calling out and rebuking by name the people who are responsible for trying to shut down the events and succeeded in getting hotels where we were holding conferences to get us kicked out. They succeeded. They succeeded in getting us to, to be annoyed. They succeeded in getting us to have to move equipment and have to tell people, no, now we're meeting here. They succeeded in, in that, but they didn't succeed in shutting down the conference because you know what? Everyone who was scheduled to preach still preached. Amen. And they didn't, they didn't succeed in, in stopping the soul winning because all the soul winning times that were scheduled all got met and people went out and people got saved. So all of the work and all of everything that was, that was intended on being done was done anyways. So all you did was waste all of your own time. Troll, tail bearer, Tuttle and Todd of the treason files. A lot of alliteration in the title of my sermon this morning because that's what it's called. It's the trolls and tail bearers Tuttle and Todd, Bob Tuttle and Todd, I don't know what his last name is. I don't care to do that much research to figure out who all these people are, but they say their names publicly, so that's who they are. And they have the Reason Files is what their YouTube channel is and a website, but we call it the Treason Files because basically they're just uh, treasonous against the Lord. But um, that's all they are is trolls and tailbirds. Now, they claim to be journalists, but really... They troll channels. They, they troll all the new IFB stuff and watch all of it and try to get up to date on all of it. And they claim to report facts, but they're really just tail bearers. Anybody, any slanderer, any railer who's willing to say anything against any of these churches, they're going to eat it up and then republish it and broadcast it and, and do whatever. And I took a little bit of time quite a while ago when the first time I had heard about this at all or seen the website, I started reading through it. They claim to report the facts and be these great journalists. Their journalism sucks. Okay, it really does. Honestly, like it's, this isn't, and it's not just because they're saying, oh, they're saying stuff against you or against your friends. You know, that's why you're saying that. No, because I know facts. I know fa like literal facts. I know facts about people. I know facts about pastors. I know facts that are reality and I know lies. And on their website, all they do is they publish a lot of lies. And oftentimes it's stupid things that don't even matter one way or the other. But it just demonstrates how poorly, how poor they exhibit journalism. You know why? Because they're not journalists. 
They're going to claim to be journalists, but they're not. They hate God. And they're just trying to confound godly people from doing a good thing. So they're going to go out and use whatever means they can to try to, to get people, their, their minds ill-affected towards brethren. That's all they're trying to do. And they're a bunch of gossipers and trolls. Now, in Acts chapter 17, we see here an event. We're going to start reading again in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture. So here's a synagogue of the Jews where they weren't believing in Jesus Christ. Did Paul go in there like, we got to shut down this false gospel right now? No. Paul, as his manner was, went in there and reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. That was his tactic of doing the right thing. He's trying to lead people to Christ. He's trying to show them the error of their way and saying, hey, no, you're doing this wrong. This is the right way of doing it. Verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. So they're having success in winning people to the Lord, winning people to Jesus Christ and showing them out of the scriptures. Hey, look, Jesus Christ, he died, was buried, rose again for you. And he had to have happened. Here's the scripture. This proves it. This shows it. And a lot of people believed. Right. So as soon as they're starting to have this great success, look at verse number five. It says, but the Jews, which believe not moved with envy. So what is part of their motivation for stopping this? They're envious. They don't like that they're having this great impact. They don't like that they're having this great influence. They believed differently. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ. They had their own false religion. And now they're envious because, wow, here's people actually doing something. Hey, here's people coming to our town and there's people that are showing up to listen to them. Hey, there's people here and they're actually doing work. They're actually going to go out and reach people. We can't have that. And they're envious over what they're doing. Because these people did nothing. These stinking Pharisees, they were sitting on their rears. They don't do anything. And these Calvinists, like Tuttle and stuff, they think they're serving God so much. They're not going out and reaching anybody. Are you kidding me? They're envious at the people who are going out and doing the work because they're not doing it themselves. Amen. They think, oh, I'm spending my time real wisely. I'm doing all this stuff and I'm going to stop them and shut them down. You fool. The Jews which believe not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So what's happening here is the Jews that believe not, they're just trying to get a lot of people stirred up against the apostles, right? They're just, just whoever they could get, and they're, and they're hiring people of a baser sort, right? Just... just degenerates out there to go and do their bidding. I'm not saying that Tuttle's doing that. Okay, but we can see the example of, exa of, of, uh, of a similar methodology of what they're trying to do in stirring up all these other people against these men of God and the people who are doing the right thing and doing a good work to cast them out of this. And ultimately, that's what they want to do. They want us out of Cincinnati because there's people that, that are part of that group of a uh, few people that are, live in Ohio or whatever. And you're, you're going to get out of our hometown or whatever. It didn't happen. Verse 6, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. See, if people doing the right thing, they're turning the world upside down. Who else is doing that? Turning the world upside down. That's, you know, that's a good indicator you found the truth when the whole world's getting flipping out and going crazy over the work that you're doing. Amen. And the other thing that's interesting too about these, about these fools, about these trolls and these tail bearers, why are they focused on us so much? We got a small church, yeah. ultimately. Pastor Mejia's got a small church. And you know, we don't have these huge mega churches, we got small churches. Why do they care about us? Why aren't they going out and shutting down the cults, the Jehovah's False Witnesses and the Mormons? Why aren't they going down and shutting down their services and stopping their events? And go? Why aren't they doing that? Because they know that they're not, they're, they're not a threat. But they know that we are. Even though we may have small numbers, we're doing great works. 
You say, oh, we're against those guys too. Yeah, really? I think you're on the same team. <laughs> then jump down to verse number 13. Bible said, oh, wait, hold on, no, verse 7, so verse 7 still, because there's one more point I want to make here, and it says, whom Jason hath received, so these that have turned the world upside down and come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus, so what are they trying to do? They're trying to get the government involved against the work that they're doing. You know how they're trying to get us kicked out of these places? They're saying, oh, look, we took these pictures, Caesar, they're not wearing masks. They're in your building and they're not wearing masks. We're going to call the health department and we're going to have them come down because they're not wearing their masks. That's the tactic that they used. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Oh, they're doing things contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Why do you care so much? People are voluntarily going into a, a, a place of, of like-minded people. They judge their own risk. And you're going to go and try to use it. And that's how they use it against these hotels because they're trying to get the hotels in trouble because the hotels have a financial interest in staying open, right? So they don't want to have, you know, health pro, you know, health codes, whatever being called or whatever on them so that they may potentially get shut down. So that's why they buckle under that pressure. But does it, does it sound like a godly Christian to go out and just starting to find all these little, these laws, these, law, these man-made laws and going, you're not following the laws. You need, you know, we need to shut these people down. Oh man, yeah. You snake. You weasel. There's no integrity. There's no honesty in that, you pathetic little cowards. Because they know they can't come down. They can't come down and confront us with the truth you know, their so-called truth. They can't come down and confront us with the Bible because they know they're going to get shut down because they don't have the truth. And not only that, they don't even have the courage to do so anyways. The people that came, they came out the first day when I was preaching. I saw one of these guys. They were sitting in there. They weren't sitting. They didn't even enter. They, they were all the way in the back and some guy had his, his phone out and he was taking some pictures. And, you know, I'm preaching, so I'm not just focused on what someone's doing standing way in the back. And I didn't know what they're doing anyway. I thought they were just recording. And when Pastor Mejia noticed there was someone trying to come in with the side, the side doors, he went out there because he thought it was someone trying to just come in, at, you know, coming in a little bit late. And, you know, the side entrances are locked because you want everybody coming in through the rear. I mean, it makes sense, right? We have our main entrance coming into the rear here. So we have people, come, you know, logistically, it just makes a lot of sense. So the side doors are locked. He thought they were trying to, to find the place and, and open up the door. So we went out there and it was just, he said something, you know, when they watch these videos, they say, oh, they exchanged words. You know what the words were exchanged? He, he went out there to see, oh, are you guys here for the conference? And they were like, no, and they ran and then literally ran. He said these guys are like middle-aged people. I couldn't, make, he's, uh, cause I asked him like, how old were they? I'm thinking, I'm trying to think like, there's no way that there's people actually, these trolls are actually coming to the event. In my mind, I'm just thinking, who would do that? Who's going to take their time on a Thursday evening to come out to a hotel and see, oh, are they preaching here? We're going to get them. I'm just thinking that's ludicrous enough anyways that someone would take the time to go out and do that. So I'm just thinking like when I heard someone just, just ra like literally ran down the hallway, I'm thinking it's got to be some kids, right? You know, some teenagers are staying at a hotel and they're wandering around, you know, and they're just kind of looking at things and, and, and whatever, and they feel like they got caught doing something and, and they're, ran, they're running away. No, but that wasn't the case. Because to me, to me, that would make sense. I remember being a little kid in, in wandering places where you're not supposed to be getting into stuff and then you run because someone catches you even though you're not really doing anything wrong. That's how they ran. They ran like cowards. But then, it, but then we realized, no, that actually was them. And Brother Mejia said, they're like in their 40s or something. I mean, he didn't know exactly how old they were. He was just looking at me. They're like middle age. And I'm thinking like, I can't see myself running. <laughs> you know, like, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> are you kidding me? How weak do you have to be? How cowardly do you have to be? But this is, this is who the enemy is. This is who these people are. A bunch of stinking cowards. You know, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. 
That's how you know they're wicked. Right. You're middle-aged and just running away like that? You're wicked. Especially when no one's pursuing you. You're saying, oh, hey, the front door's over here. You want to come to the conference? <laughs> no! <laughs> That's what happened. It's craziness. But that's what they did here. Oh, hey, Jason's got these guys over here. They're doing things contrary to the decrees of Caesar. They're not wearing their masks. But you know what's interesting, though? When I was in that hotel, because we stayed in that hotel, I didn't, I didn't wear a mask one time, and no one said one word to me. You know, I don't care if people wear masks. Again, I've said this before. It doesn't matter to me. Go ahead. I'm not, I'm not bagging on people for wearing masks. It's not, that's not the issue at all. I just think people should be free to choose whether they want to wear one or not. Amen. And it's interesting how something that really wasn't a big deal became a big deal just because we're having a conference there. Or just because some bully wants to try to, to get us shut down. But then look at verse number 13. In the same chapter, chapter 17, the Bible says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, because when they, when they ended up leaving here in Thessalonica, they're leaving, right? They move on and they're like, okay, we're going to preach the gospel here at Berea. So then these Jews who are causing all these problems there, it says when they had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. So this, this tactic or this mindset of just following them everywhere they're going, trolling them, that's what wicked people do. And that's what they did to the apostles and the disciples in the book of Acts. And they're still doing the same thing today. The tactics haven't changed. So it's pretty easy to identify the wicked people and the people trying to stop the work of God because they're doing the exact same things. They're going to follow you everywhere you go to try to stop the preaching of the word of God. But you know what? To me, that's just encouraging because it just says, hey, I'm in good company. If I'm being part of something that, that people are just continually trying to shut down and they're acting like this and they're acting like little weasels and they're going and, and trying to do whatever they can to shut you down. You know what that tells me? That tells me I'm on the winning side. That tells me I'm on the right side because that's how people react. That's how wicked people react against the truth. That's how cockroaches react to the light. Flip back, if you would, to Acts chapter 7. Like I said, we're going to go through a lot of the book of Acts because we, we see these various methodologies and tactics being used, and I think this applies perfectly to those trolls and talebearers, Tuttle and Todd, Todd from the Reason Files. And you know, Tuttle, instead of, instead of attacking this guy, I don't know how old he is, but he says on his, on his website that he's, he has great-grandchildren. And that, you know, he had attended church for a real long time, but he, he thought he was saved. He swear that he was saved, but he really wasn't saved. But now he's saved. And this guy just believes in a hardcore lordship salvation and just total works. He says, oh, no, it's not by works. But you know how you know people are saved if they're doing works. Right? It's total lordship salvation. And you know, Tuttle, for the time, because you're, you're an aged man, and been around for a long time. For the time, you ought to be teachers. You have one that, that you, have, you have need that one teach you again, which be the, the principles of the oracles of God. You know, the fundamentalist conference, instead of trying to shut it down, you should have took up a seat and listened to it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Amen. It's good. Because you have a problem with the foundations. You thought you were saved before and you weren't, and guess what? You think you're saved now and you're not. And I hope you're not a reprobate, because you sure are acting like one. I hope you're just like Saul who was attacking the churches of God, but was doing so ignorantly in unbelief. Look at Acts 7, verse number 51. Because the people that just cannot stand the word of God, they just want to stop their ears at it. They don't want to hear. They don't want to reason. Or he calls it the reason files. He doesn't want to reason. He can't stand the truth. He wants to stop his ears like they did. Acts chapter 7, of course, is that famous passage where Stephen becomes a martyr and Stephen's preaching this great sermon and then the Jews just couldn't take it anymore and they stop their ears and they run on him and they stone him and they kill him. Verse number 51, this is the rebuke given forth by Stephen saying, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And you know what? That Tuttle's a Calvinist too. And you know what? For Calvinists, there's part of their two-lip theology, irresistible grace. 
What do you say about Acts 7.51? Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. How can it be irresistible if the Holy Ghost is dealing with someone and it's irresistible? I mean, it's sovereign God. It's irresistible. You cannot resist. When the Holy Ghost is Christ calling you, you can't. You always resist the Holy Ghost. He's not saying you always resist a man. You always resist the Holy Ghost. You can resist the Holy Ghost because God has given you a free will. He's given you the ability to choose whether you're going to accept that calling, whether or not you're going to put your trust in Jesus Christ or not. You have that choice. God doesn't just will it over your will and just say, nope, I don't even care if you don't want it. I'm just taking you anyways. He doesn't do that. He's given us free will. He's given us the opportunity to make a choice. And people, these people are being uh, uh, rebuked here because they always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so did ye. And you know what? They don't like to hear that. Look at verse number 52. The Bible says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been, ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So, they don't like to hear that truth. They don't like being called out for what they did. They don't like being called murderers. They don't like saying, oh, you're resisting the Holy Ghost because they were religious people. They thought they had the truth. They didn't. But this is how they respond. They respond in wrath and anger and malice. And here we see... Uh, how Stephen responds, verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They stopped their ears. I mean, they literally did, didn't want to hear the message so much that all they could do is just go, no, and stop their ears and then just run on him and just try to silence him because they couldn't take it. This is how the enemy responds to the truth, to the light, when it's being shown. They can't handle it. But notice on the flip side, that's not how the godly, how the apostles and the disciples, when they ran across someone who spoke falsely, and it, they, they weren't stopping their ears and killing them. <laughs> you never see that happen. They could just curse them and move on. And go about their business. They don't, they don't just, just say, no, I can't stand it. The, the Bible says that they couldn't resist the wisdom of Stephen. It says in verse 58, it says, And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So you see the difference between the wicked people and the righteous one. Flip over to Acts chapter 9. They can't hear it. They want to shut it down. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. We're going to see here Saul, before, before he got saved, he was doing wicked things. He was a wicked person. Okay, now he got saved, thank God, right? And he did the things that he did ignorantly in unbelief, but he still did a lot of really wicked things. That's why he said he's chief of sinners and he did all these things. And basically, if he could be saved, he's kind of showing how, how God can still show mercy on people and they can still become saved even though they're doing some really, really, really bad things, Amen. right? And that, and that was another reason, I think, for, you know, that, that we can read all this about the Apostle Paul, and there's that great testimony there. Uh, there's, there's so many things to learn from that. But let's look at what Saul was doing before he became the Apostle Paul. Verse number one, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So this is what wicked people do is they utter threatenings. 
right? And they go out and try to threaten you and try to get people in authority to say, oh, give me the permission to go and get these guys. And I want to arrest these guys. I want to take them down. And we're going to threaten them and we're going to do whatever we can to get them to shut up. That's what people do that are against the truth. But we don't see the people who are for the truth doing it. We don't see the disciples. Again, it, this is, this is uh, repetitive. We see this over and over again. Look at Acts chapter 13. Preventing souls from being saved. It's another tactic. Why, why would they try to shut down? You know, I understand why the, the homos want to shut down a conference that's completely against them. I understand that. I mean, you're, you're saying things that are just completely contrary against them. This is a fundamentalist conference. Right. Talking about foundational truths like salvation, the word of God, you know, everything that Hebrews 6 is talking about in the first two verses, you know, baptism, things like that. These, these just real basic truths. That's what it means to be fundamental. It's foundational. I preach a whole sermon about that on the first night. I mean, the sermon was just about being fundamentalist and why it's right. Why does that drive people nuts? Why would that drive someone nuts? Logically, it should have no, you should have no cause for that. You know what else was going on, though, is the soul winning. And if, the, and, and if these doctrines, which, which the funny thing is, is that even the, like, like my sermon, I'm not going to speak for the other ones necessarily because I don't, I don't even know. I don't know if my sermon goes against what they even believe. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know, but the, my point is like they're trying to go through all this effort to shut it down. If it's not because of the doctrines that are being taught there, then why is it? The only other reason would be because of the soul winning. Because we're going out and actually reaching people there. Because why would you, it's, it's like shutting down a church. Why do you care about shutting down a place where we all believe the same thing? Even if you shut us down, we're still going to believe the same thing. It's not going to change what we believe, getting someone shut down. And the people attending our conference we all believe the same thing. That's why we're coming together. We're going there to stir up people in another area and, and help edify them and motivate them and do, you know, and do good in that area as well as go out and reach the people of the city. So even just the concept of trying to shut someone down, is like we all believe, we're not going to change our beliefs by shutting down our conference. And it wasn't an open conference in the sense that we advertised it and broadcast it for just everyone to show up. It was limited seats. It was offered to people who wanted to come anyways. Not that we were, you know, turning people away or anything. It was just, but it was, the whole point was to, to preach to like-minded people. We're not going and, and imposing our will on people that don't want to hear what you have to say, whatever. Like, not at the conference. And we don't impose our will on anyone anyways. And we go out soul winning. We talk to people who want to talk to us. We preach the gospel to people who are willing to listen. We're not, trying, we're not trying to take these people that were like stoning Peter that shut their ears and going like, like no, you're going to hear us. We don't, <laughs> like, we don't do that. Because it's fruitless and foolish. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. But we see here in Acts uh, 13 an example of some devilish person trying to prevent people from getting saved. And that's exactly what was going on as well in this conference uh, by by. Tuttle and Todd. Acts 13, verse number 5, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Verse number 6, Acts 13, 6, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's someone, he wants to hear the word of God. He's requesting it. He's asking, he's like, here, come here, please, and preach to me. I want to hear the word of God. And you know what? I was invited by someone who lives in Ohio to come to this conference. Someone was putting this on. I was invited by Brett Stockton, who lives out there and has a group of people live out there and inviting saying, hey, we want you to come and preach for us. Can you please preach the word of God to us here? Verse number eight, but Elymas the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, 
thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? These are people trying to prevent the word of God from being preached. And he's calling this guy a child of the devil. You know, who child of the devil, their characteristics and their attributes, they're subtle. They're full of all mischief. They're just trying to cause these problems. Um, enemy of all righteousness, and they're perverting the right ways of the Lord. Verse 11, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Paul did not shut him, the other guy down, he cursed him in the name of the Lord, and you know what? God heard him, and God took care of it. He didn't have to pick up a stone. He didn't have to take his mask and put it on Bar Jesus, right? So he'd shut up and put duct tape around it or do anything like that. God did it for him. God took care of it for him. And what's, what I really love, what's really interesting about this, I don't know if you've ever heard this or noticed this before, in verse number 12. So, just, just prior to this, when Paul curses this guy, he has this mist and this darkness, and basically he becomes blind. So it's like, whoa, he just, like, like to me, that's the astonishing thing, right? You'd be like, if you were to stand in there, why do you want to hear the word of God? And you're like, man, that, that dude just, like, he just caused that guy to go blind. Right? You would think, like, like just naturally, you might just think, like, that's really, a, that's the astonishing thing. But that's not why the deputy was astonished. Look at verse number 12. It says, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. I mean, the doctrine, it's the teaching. And the teaching was trying to be stopped. The, the doctrine is what was trying to be prevented. And the doctrine is what had the power anyways. It was the teaching of the Lord. It was the power of God through the doctrine that, that was able to do these things. And you know what? It's the doctrine of Christ, that base, fundamental, foundational uh, teaching doctrine of Christ that that Jesus Christ died was buried and rose again from the dead that is power that's astonishing oh you mean to tell me there was a man that that did all these things and healed all these people and never commit sin and he was he was crucified and actually put to death but death couldn't stop him and he rose again from the dead and you guys saw him, you know, that's astonishing. You put your faith in that, in the faith that he did all that for you. There's real power there. Jump down to verse number 45. Again, we just see the same themes repeating themselves from the enemies. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Again, they're envious because they see all the, all the crowds, all the people doing the work, right? And all the people responding and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing he put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And you know what's funny is that at least the, the people in the book of Acts, the, the enemies, had a lot more boldness than the people that we faced. So... And, and I'm not comparing ourselves completely to what the apostles and disciples went through because they experienced way, 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 way worse persecution. Right? So don't, don't you know, I'm not getting this complex about saying, oh, we're suffering just exactly like that. No. What I'm trying to point out is the tactics being used and the subtlety and the mischief and, and just the snake-like attributes that, are, that were being used back then are the same ones being used today. Our level or severity of the persecution is much, much, much lighter. It is. It was a nuisance. It was an irritation. Now, it still fires us up, but it, but it, wasn't, it wasn't like what they were going through other than just in a similar tactic and, and the people, the characteristics of the wicked people are the same today as they ever have been. Uh, verse number, jump down to now verse number 49 here in Acts 13. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. So they're saying, you guys got to get out of there. 
Gotta get out of get out of our town, right? You get get out of our coasts. So they raised, they're trying to get people to bring persecution. Verse 51, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And again, this is the Christian response. You know what? We're going to shake off the dust of our feet against you. And if you don't know exactly what that means, well, what does it mean when it says they shook off the dust of their feet against them? Well, Jesus told his disciples to shake off the dust of their feet as a testimony against people who were basically going to be wicked people and not receive you. And I'm going to read this for you from Mark 6, verse 11. The Bible reads, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. He's saying the reason why you're going to do this, it's a testimony against them. And he went on to say, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now Jesus was giving him, giving the disciples, that instruction of shaking off the dust of their feet, basically against an entire city. So if you go into a city and like no one wants to hear the word of God, and it's just real cold and unreceptive and no one wants you there and no one's even going to accept you into their house so you can do this work. He says, you know what? Just shake off the dust of your feet and move on. Because shaking off the dust of your feet is, is a testimony showing, you know what? I don't even want the dust of your feet of your city to, to, be, to cleave to me because the judgment from God is going to come and I don't have anything to do with you when that judgment comes. You had your opportunity. Now I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to take one little grain of sand or dirt with me as I depart from your city. God's going to judge you and bring you to, to dust and ashes like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. So that was towards the city, but we see in Acts 13, they shook off the dust of their feet against these Jews who were causing all these problems. It wasn't against necessarily the entire city, but it was against these wicked people who were trying to get everyone stirred up against them. So obviously you can make the application like that. And you know what? I'm doing the same exact thing with these people who are trying to shut down, you know, what we're doing and, and the work that's being done here. We're going to sh shake the dust off our feet against them. Does that mean I'm going to go, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, use my computer skills and I'm going to get their website shut down and I'm going to, you know, try to, I'm going to find some dirt on them and get them shut down. No, I'm not going to do that. Time for that. We've got a lot more important things to do. I'm going to shake the dust of my feet off and go do something for the Lord. I'm going, to spite, I'm going to fight the spiritual battle, not the carnal battle. Right? The carnal battle is going around and trying to, to you shut these... You know, I'm going to go and try to shut the JWs down and the Mormons down. You know what? There's going to be false doctrine and false religion all the time. There's people who always want to have... that have itching ears. They're going to heap to themselves these teachers. They're going to say what they want them to say anyways. They're always going to be there. So I'm not going to go and just try to shut them all down. That's the carnal mind trying to figure out how to stop something. I'm going to fight the spiritual battle and I'm going to preach the word of God and, and let the word of God do the, do the cutting and do the piercing for me. Last place we'll look, Acts chapter 14. Verse number one, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. And you know, these snakes, they're going to try to get you to focus on the lies or speculate on some details to make your mind evil affected about others or try to lead you astray in some way. And that's what the Reason Files does. They take all this speculation and they look at things that happen and, you know, admittedly some bad things that happened with, you know, maybe with Pastor Romero and just other incidents that have happened in their churches that were a spot and a blemish and, and you know, a shame. But then they try to, to spread that further than it actually went and try to come up with these stories. And you've got people who are disgruntled. And you've got false brethren that have crept in unawares and now are out of churches and they're trying to, to slander and spread lies and stuff. And don't get caught up in all those little stupid lies and falsehoods because all they're trying to do is get your mind evil affected against people who are doing good works. And that's why one of the ways that the Bible explains of how you can know whether a tree is good or not is by its fruit. How are they reproducing? How are the, how, do the pastors have a ministry where they have, they have people following them and all the people are saved and they're bringing forth saved Christians and people who are believers? Or are they not doing that? 
Are they bringing forth, you know, reprobates? And you can tell that, but you know, you can't tell that from a distance either. You actually have to go. You actually have to go in person physically. You're never going to know that on the internet. You won't. You need to talk to people. You need to talk to the congregation. You need to talk, you know, see what's going on. Go out with them as they do the work. Go, you know, be a part of it. And then you'll be able to get an idea for the fruit of the ministry. If you just went based off of what people say online and who they claim that they follow or even, you know, people can be lying all day long. You have no idea. And people just throw out speculations and insinuate things and they don't even have evidence. And that's what these so-called journalists do. Well, we're just, saying, we're just reporting on what they said. Well, how about you report the facts instead of just what he said, she said, you bunch of gossips, right. bunch of ladies. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. I don't, no offense to you because these guys are, are way worse. Tail bearers. Anyhow. I think the rebuke was necessary. I just thought it was interesting, though, to, to, to kind of see the same tactics play out with, with what's going on and what, and what we're doing. And honestly, the impact that you're having, the impact that we're having is, is significant. If it wasn't, people wouldn't be out there trying to shut it down. They wouldn't. They wouldn't care. So don't ever get discouraged. Continue. Be motivated keep doing the work, you know, I feel like we're still just barely scratching the surface. Like I, and I know that we are. There's so much more work to be done. But let's be minded in a way that is on, on a big impact scale. Let's be like, because I don't feel like we're, tur like, like that we're turning the world upside down like the disciples were. But I'd like to be known for that. Hey, these guys that are turning the world upside down, now, we may be part of a bigger group that is, but I, I mean, I want to be at the, at the front, right? Let's lead that charge. Let's be known as a church that's turning the world upside down, but it's not because we're just coming up with some brand new things and we have some new doctrine and we're some cult, but it's because of the word of God, because we're truthfully going out and preaching the word of God and not censoring the word of God and preaching all of the word of God and actually dedicated and will give of ourselves and give sacrifices of our time to go out and reach people and to promote the word of God and do so to the best of our ability because we actually believe in it. We actually care about it. There's sincerity and integrity and truth and people will see that and it's going to make an impact and a change on people when you can go forth bearing the word of God, shining that light and, and people will see the sincerity as well as the truth of the gospel. That we could be good workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. That people can see our testimony that you actually do believe this and then be much more willing to receive the word of God in its truth. Let's turn the world upside down. And you know what? As we do so, don't be surprised when people try to shut us down and stop us. Don't be surprised when people call the fire department. Oh, they don't have their certificate of occupancy. Remember that? Don't be surprised when people try to shut down events. Don't be surprised what, you know, I'm still seeing and have a vision for us being able to host and do other conferences and other things ourselves as we gain steam and momentum to be able to do more things like that too. We're going to run into obstacles. People don't want to hear the truth. But let, don't let that get you down. Let it fire you up. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great truths that we see in the book of Acts. Man, the book of Acts is so exciting, Lord. I pray that you would please just uh, fill us with your spirit and your power that we can go out and do uh, similar acts like, like we're done way back um, after the resurrection of Christ, dear Lord, and, and that you would, you would help us to do these great things and, and to see multitudes get saved, dear Lord. And I pray that you would just help us to be a, a light that shines in a dark place and help us to, to just um, to do your will, Lord, and not to get distracted and not get caught up in carnal fights, but that we could be spiritually minded. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.